Welcome to Sunday service at Ananda. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And if you need the words to the songs or the chants, they're in the seat back in front of you. Please rise for the opening prayer. Buenos dias. <laughs> we just got back from Mexico late, late last night. So the voice of God calls to us in English to awaken to his presence within. How will he find us when he comes? Awake and ready. And when he asks us to dedicate ourselves to him ever more perfectly, how will he find us? Awake and ready. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, friend, beloved God Great, Masters, Great Masters, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Babaji Krishna, Krishna Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Paramahansa Yogananda, and saints of East and West. We invoke thy loving presence. We invoke thy loving presence. Divine Mother. Divine Mother. In my consciousness. In my consciousness. Like the stars of the vast sky above. Like the stars of the vast sky above. Our endless thoughts and desires. Our endless thoughts and desires. But upon the dawn of your coming. But upon the dawn of your coming. The sunshine of your love. The sunshine of your love. Will eclipse all lower things. Will eclipse all lower things. Awaken me to your presence. Awaken me to your presence. God alone. God alone. Om. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats and have some music. Song from Swami Krishnanamak called I Wander With Thee. Our first chant today is on page 23. 
Saint Teresa of Avila's admonition. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you. All things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you'll want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. Let nothing disturb you, nothing things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory. Once you have God, you'll want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. Let Nothing disturb you, nothing affright you, all things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings you to victory, once you have God, you'll want nothing more. God alone, God alone, God alone's all we ever need. God alone, God alone, God alone. Children to Sunday school, and we'll go into a brief meditation with this chant on page 24, Sri Yogananda. <coughs> Radhe Govinda Sri 
Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Hare Krishna Hare Rama Sri Radhe Govinda Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Hare Krishna Hare Rama Sri Radhe Govinda Sri Yoga Nanda Guide to inner freedom Steal into my heart of hearts Banish my Focusing first on the heart. Visualize strings of desire all fastened to the heart in all directions. And then mentally take the scissors of wisdom and discernment and cut those strings. All of those strings removed and allow the heart to soar. The spirit of the heart, the love of the heart to the spiritual eye, the point between the eyebrows. Call to God there in the language of your own heart. Remaining inwardly focused now. Let's listen to this description of the quality of awareness from the book Affirmations for Self-Healing by Swami Kriyananda. He writes, Awareness deepens the more it is centered in itself. But the farther a person's interests extend outside himself, the thinner the supply line of his awareness becomes. If a person's consciousness is centered outwardly in things, it takes on those qualities which it attributes to those things. Jewelers, for instance, often have bright eyes. People with no sense of higher values have dead eyes. Man needs to learn to change his focus from what he is aware of to what he is aware with. He needs to become more aware at the source of his awareness, at his deepest center, which is God. Through this awareness, his enjoyment even of the surrounding world becomes intensified a thousandfold. Let's affirm together. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and of faith. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and of faith. 
For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. So I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and of faith. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and of faith. For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. And now in a whisper to the subconscious mind, I behold the world with eyes of calmness and of faith. For I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. Now silently affirm, concentrating at the point between the eyebrows. I behold the world with eyes of calmness and of faith, for I know that as I view others, so will I myself become. Infuse me from my deepest center with thy joy, O Lord. Make me aware of thee, my divine beloved, in all that I behold. Today's reading. Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, Weekly Commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. In surrender lies victory. Truth is one and eternal. Realize one is with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. A case might be made for surrender as a path to victory in worldly conflicts. The way of passive resistance, for example, in preference to armed resistance. But our point here concerns a higher kind of surrender. The surrender of our deluded egoic will to the wise and almighty will of God. Human will is, as Paramahansa Yogananda said, guided by whims and limited understanding. The divine will is in harmony with every level of reality. Though the divine will sometimes appears to us at first to be wrong, it proves always, eventually, to be for our highest good. Human will is inconsistent. It leads us one day to success, another to disaster. The divine will, when we surrender to it completely, though it is not always easy to do so, always brings us deeper, always brings us deep inner peace and joy in the end. Jesus Christ demonstrated this perfect surrender to God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was captured and imprisoned, preparatory to his crucifixion. He went apart from the others to pray and asked them to pray also, but when he returned to them, he found them asleep. Out of his love for them, he excused them, saying, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He then urged them again, saying, Watch and pray. Their weakness in those circumstances was particularly sad, and the disciples themselves must have regretted it bitterly later on. We all know the symptoms of human weaknesses though we may excuse them in ourselves, saying, well, after all, I'm only human. But what are the signs of true strength? We find in all cases that these are the fruit of a life wholly surrendered to God. The Bhagavad Gita lists these signs in the 13th chapter. Humbleness, truthfulness and harmlessness, patience and honor, reverence for the wise, purity, constancy, control of self, Content for sense delights, self-sacrifice, perception of the certainty of ill in birth, old age, and frail mortality, disease, the ego suffering and sin, detachment, lightly holding thoughts of home, children, and wife, those ties which bind most men, an ever tranquil heart, heedless of good or adverse fortune with the will upraised, to worship me alone unceasingly, loving deep solitude and shunning noise, of foolish crowds, calm focus on the self, 
perceived within and in infinity. These qualities reveal true wisdom, Prince. All that is otherwise is ignorance. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. today, <laughs> Bimaji. Good morning. <laughs> Let me get some holy water there. <laughs> well, it's good to have Riman and Padma back with us. Um, I often tell people that it feels a little too quiet when they're away. Uh, and I think most people who live in the community know why that is. Um, when you live a life in surrender to God, and you've given your life uh, to God as those who are swamis and all of us are trying to um, live up to, uh, you live in a creative flow, which uh, to the ego can be kind of scary. And um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Hrimon and Padma and for all of those in the community uh, who encourage me to step out of my box. Um, and I think we can all say the same. It's, it's a real blessing to live in community um, in this community, we have the opportunity to live close together, and in our Sangha, we meditate together, which is pretty uncommon if you go to just your average church. Um, you got the pews, and then you've got coffee hour, and that's about it. And here we have endless opportunities to encourage one another uh, to go deeper and to get outside of our egos, so it's a tremendous blessing. So I, was, I work at East West Bookshop, and we get all sorts of um, characters in, and I heard a great story, which I want to share with you guys. Um, so there were five people who were on an airplane, and things were not going so well. Um, in fact, there weren't any of the engines working. <laughs> and these five people um, all had various uh, important things to do. There was uh, a famous musician um, who's actually with us today, Rocky Votolato. <laughs> and you'll see, you'll see that, that the miracle uh, that is his life after this story. Um, you had uh, a famous inventor and energy mogul, Elon Musk. Um, you have uh, President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Um, and there is also uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis and a little schoolgirl. So they're all on this plane. I don't know where all the other passengers are, but it's going down. And uh, they look around and they only see that there are four safety devices in the shapes of parachutes. And they start looking at each other. And of course, the first to stand up is our friend Rocky. And he says, look, guys, I got a lot of fans out there. And they're going to be devastated if I don't make it off of this plane. And uh, plus, I got a big European tour coming up. So, um, so they all say, OK, OK. You know, he takes the, f the first of the four parachutes, and uh, he makes it back to Larch Way. And he's here today. So that's, that's the good news. Um, you've got Elon Musk. And he says in his broken South African accent, uh, we have a new generation of people coming together. And we need energy. And how are we going to get onto the Mars and onto the moon with colonies if I go down in this plane? So they're like, OK, that makes sense. You can go. So he uh, makes it back to wherever he lives. And uh, then you got, you got one, um, two parachutes left. And of course, Donald Trump, um, he's like, look, guys, I you know, you're doing a tremendous job up here in this airplane. And, um, you know, but I got a charity dinner at Mar-a-Lago I got to make it to. And on top of that, I'm also the president of the United States. I mean, cut me some slack. So he takes it and jumps off. And it's the Pope and the little girl. And by now, they're at about 1,000 feet elevation and um, altitude. And, uh, and they look at each other. And, you know, Pope Francis, he's like, well, you know, I've had a long life. And I'm close to God. And... You really should. You've got a whole life ahead of you. Who knows what you're going to do with your life? Uh, you should take the parachute. And the little girl says, um, excuse me, Mr. Pope, but I don't see the problem here. You see, 
President Trump took my backpack. <laughs> so you can see you can see how um, the ego can misguide you. You know, I mean, uh, when you're living uh, in the head and you're living um, in what you think your life is about. Um, you can often uh, not be in tune with divine grace. Um, it's a little bit of a stretch, but <laughs> you got to start somewhere. So um, I was, my mom is an Episcopal priest, and then it dawned on me, my grandfather's an Episcopal priest, and it looks like this is some big setup now. I'm, I'm up here giving a talk, too. Um, but uh, I was talking to her about, about the talk, and she said, how do you guys do it here? And I said, well, we got this commentary, and we've got the Bhagavad Gita, and we've got the Bible, and... And she shared with me what they're doing at Sunday service right now. Uh, and it was interesting. Uh, I'm actually going to touch on that because I thought it, was, it, it kind of fit along. But I read to her the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita portion where holding uh, lightly the thought of home and wife and children. And I was like, oh, that's particular fitting because Bhakti and I are going to have a baby in December. And <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to speak to that um, really, really quickly. Um, you know, we all have our own, our own path and our own karma, and, um, and this community is really unique in that it embraces uh, families, and it embraces all walks of life, and um, it's really neat. You know, Lahiri Mahashaya, who's um, the, uh, the Kriya mad scientist, I think Kriyaman calls him, um, he was a householder, and he didn't, and he lived a householder throughout his days, and he, he and, uh, of course, Yogananda's father, Bhagavati, had, uh, gave us a wonderful example of how you can balance uh, a life taking care of family and home and have a regular job and still uh, carve out the time for deep meditation and living a life of faith. Um, so they're not mutually exclusive at all. Um, there is a great saint who's mentioned in the autobiography of a yogi. Um, he's known as Master Mahashaya, but uh, in, his real name was Mahendranath Gupta, um, which I love to say. And when he came to Ramakrishna, uh, Ramakrishna asked him a couple questions. He said, uh, are you married? And he thought, oh, oh yes, I'm, I'm married. I've got a wife. And he says, uh, oh, Ram Lal, he's married. And kind of with this chagrin on his face. He's like, oh, gosh, I'm blowing this interview. And then he says, well, do you have children? He's like, oh, yes, I have children. He's like, he even has children. And for us, you know, living, living the life uh, of uh, meditation and balancing it uh, is difficult, but there's great reward and there's great fruitfulness in that. Um, so anyway, th today with our topic of uh, surrender, in surrender lies victory, I thought the chant, uh, God alone, was a great one. Um, when I first came to Ananda, um, I think that was one of the chants that was played at Sunday service, and I thought it was so neat, the, the idea of um, patient endurance leads you to victory. Once you have God, you'll want nothing more. And I thought, wow, what an amazing state of consciousness to be in, to, to be totally filled and to have no desire for anything. And sure enough, when I got out of Sunday service and I met some of the people around the village, um, I soon found out that the oldest people were the people wearing blue. And I thought, well, OK, interesting. And uh, or maybe the people wearing blue were the oldest people. I, can't, I, I don't know which comes first. But, but all of them had this joy, this twinkle in their eyes. Uh, there is one gentleman down there, Ananta, who I remember having the distinct feeling, and it was interesting because I grew up in the church, and you'd think if you run into holiness, you'd run into it in the church, but I didn't really see any of that growing up. And I got the distinct feeling that he wanted nothing from me. And then I looked at him, and he wanted nothing from anybody, and he wanted nothing from life, it seemed like. He was totally content. And I thought, well, that's a miracle. You know, to, to be able to, how do I attain that? When I, uh, when I first got into spirituality, uh, my entree before the Autobiography of a Yogi was uh, with Ram Dass's Be Here Now. And he describes the life of somebody who lives in perfect freedom, one who surrendered to God's will. And he talks about his own guru, Neem Karoli Baba, who he calls Maharaji. And there's just story after story of this individual. They could never figure him out. 
you know, he wouldn't spend one play, he wouldn't spend it, you know, sometimes he'd be somewhere for a year. And then on, on a whim, he'd sneak out in the middle of the night and he'd leave all of these disciples stranded and they wouldn't know where he is. And, and it was in, in the 70s in India and they had no way of, you know, they couldn't text and there weren't, you know, um, there weren't facial recognition, you know, they just had to figure out where this guy was. And, but the story was really incredible to me because um, at that point in my life, as most of us do, I equated freedom with doing whatever I want to do. And then you see uh, an individual who talks about surrendering to God and living a life outside of the senses, outside of uh, joy outside of ourselves, but joy within. And these people are living a truly creative life. And it really, really inspired me. Um, I'm sure Hemant and Padma can attest to living with Swami Kriyananda. Um, you know, when you're in the presence of a saint, it's, it's unpredictable, it's totally original, sometimes embarrassing. Um, they're just not living in the box of habit. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this process. I call it uh, Yogananda's Five Steps into Ego. Um, it's from a talk that he gave. Uh, he didn't call it that. I, I like to make up names for my, for, you know, my thought processes. But um, he was giving a talk about how we, um, how we become who we are. How we, how we live in the ego. And he said, first, you have a thought. And you don't really have a thought. You just perceive the thought. You're not creating it. It's something you're tuning into. And then it gets mixed up with the feeling, with the chitta, if you've studied Raja Yoga. And this feeling and thought that you've magnetized then um, descends into will, into the physical. And it becomes an action. And this action then magnetizes more and more actions like it, and they become these habits. So they're on the fourth step now. And then the fifth step, all of these habits crystallize and they become your personality. And then, and, and that's who you are. Now you're, you're, you took a thought, and we've had how many billions of thoughts have passed through our minds, and the ones that we select and that we draw to ourselves and make manifest through our desires, they become who we are. I thought that was a wonderful um, illustration. And I thought, well, okay, if this is how we descend into this uh, small reality because we could live, rather than living in the thoughts and attracting them, we could live in the space, the infinite space around thoughts. We could live in awareness itself and true freedom. How do we get back to it? So I took the liberty to create uh, the five easy steps out of ego and I want to share that with you guys. So I figured that if ego uh, if you descend from thought, from the causal, from awareness itself, into this ego identity, then we can just retrace our steps and we can make our way back out of it again. <laughs> so I thought, okay, first of all, if where we've ended up with our ego, let's question our ego. Let's question our identity about who we think we are. And that could take all day. Just meditate on that all day. <laughs> And then become aware of your habits. Where am I placing, how am I dividing my time? You know, I was talking to my mom and she says uh, last night, and she said, gosh, you know, it's so true. We need to get out of our little box of activities. How many times have I watched that two hour romantic comedy? Like seven or eight times? Like I could be doing something different, you know? And I think that we can all relate to that. Control your actions, making your way, once you've recognized your habit patterns, once you've questioned that you are, that your identity is this person who happens to go bowling every Saturday night or whatever it is, control your actions. Now you're in the moment. You're in the present moment and you have control over your life. You can choose what you want to do. You do not have to live in a small reality that's been, that's been predilected by all of your past actions, by your karma. Cleanse your desires. This is where we, this is where meditation is so important because people are moving around so fast they have no idea what they want until they've already gone after it. And then they're stuck with the feeling of having gone after something. They didn't actually get what they wanted, which was bliss, which was divine happiness. And then, of course, the most subtle is to let your thoughts pass. When you're sitting in meditation, you have the opportunity to be in pure awareness and to be abiding in God and to not be being pulled in every different direction by your thoughts, living in the present moment. So I thought those, those would be helpful for us. They, um, if we can retrace our steps of how we got to where we are, it just takes, all it takes is uh, being awake and ready. Like, 
Yogananda said before he'd even get on the stage, he would ask people if they were awake and if they're ready. And if, and if so, then we have a chance. But if we're asleep at the wheel, we don't have a chance at any of this. We're not truly alive. So um, there's a great, great quote from the New Path. Good heavens, I can't believe how long I've been talking already. Um, I was I was talking to Bhakti. I was like, I don't think I'm going to have an. Uh, I'm going to. I don't think I'm going to be able to fill this slot. I should do a guided meditation or something. You know? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so this is from Swami Kriyananda's autobiography, The New Path. He says, um, and this is Yogananda talking to him. And I think it really clarifies the topic because uh, oftentimes you can think of surrender. At least we do in the West. We think of it as giving up, but it's a whole lot more when you when you look at surrendering to God's will. When I met my master, Sri Yukteswar, Yogananda said to Swami, he said, allow me to discipline you. Why, sir? I inquired. Because, he replied, in the beginning of the spiritual path, one's will is guided by whims and fancies. Mine was, too. Oh, this, I'm sorry, this is Sri Yukteswar talking uh, to Yogananda. My bad. Um, Sri Yukteswar continued, until I met my guru, Lahiri Mahashaya, it was only by attuning my haphazard will to his wisdom-guided will that I found true freedom. In the same way, if you attune your will to mine, you too will find freedom. To act only on the inspiration of whims and fancies is not freedom, but bondage. Only by doing God's will can you find what you are seeking. And uh, just hearing, hearing those words, even from an enlightened master like Sri Yukteswar, um, shows us that what we think is our freedom is just built off of all of these activities, all these actions that we've had, um, desires and aversions. It's a very narrow existence. Um, before I came to Ananda, uh, I lived very much in my own little box, and there were certain things just by my own native tendencies that I was comfortable with. You know, some of those might be um, thinking, sharing with my opinions with people, uh, I picked up the guitar. You know, I had a very, you know, I had a, I had a pretty uh, small realm of activity. And of course, I joined a spiritual community, and then I see my whole little world being blown wide open. And it's been a wonderful experience. Um, really, what it comes down to is saying yes to life. When we can say yes, and if you tune into your heart, there's an opening there. You feel an openness in your heart when you say yes. And I was reflecting that when we can say yes to something, even if there's a resistance there. Those yeses are, are what we remember at the end of our life. When we, we'll remember all the times when we were able to step out of our comfort zone. And all the people that we, that we love and admire in society and we look up to in history were all of these yes people. And not saying yes to something they didn't believe in, but saying yes to a still voice inside. And saying yes to the intuitive feeling in their heart and saying yes to God. And whenever we say no, we shut the door on what could be. Um, we, when we say yes to our whims and fancies, we're like that uh, hamster going in the wheel, the wheel of samsara. We're going over and over again the same pathways, you know. I could, every Sunday I could go to taco time if I, if I, just, <laughs> if I said yes to only that, you know. Um, but we could break out. We could be free. And what does that mean? What does it look like to be free? To be truly free, that's something to meditate on. Uh, when I first started meditating, I had all these habits that I didn't really realize I had. I mean, people tell you that, you know, don't smoke. It's like, okay, don't smoke. Why? Oh, it's bad for you. Okay, it's bad for you. You know, but then when you actually start to meditate and you're like, you can feel this compulsion and this, this kind of this madness of staying in the same, same track over and over and over again. You want to be free from that. You want to be able to be creative in your life. Um, and that true spontaneity and that, that true freedom to, to, uh, to just live outside of this karmic thraldom is really remarkable. A um, couple examples. I was doing inventory uh, at the store a couple years back, and I thought at that moment that I was at my limit, you know. I was like, okay, I've been here for, until 3 a.m. every night. You know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing the work, you know. I'm doing karma yoga. And uh, so I deserve a break. So uh, I call my buddy Pete, and we go to a movie. I don't remember what it was. Um, something obviously really important. Um, and uh, so it's about you know 10 o'clock at night, and 
and I look at my phone, and I got a message from somebody saying, hey, you're on Master's Kitchen Cleanup. Um, so where are you? And I'm like, well, I'm not there, that's for sure. And uh, so I, I text back, and I say, well, just save me half or whatever, you know. And usually, usually, and I, I'm, it's always a blessing to those angels. I, I, when they say save me half, they just, all, they just do it all. And I'm like, that's amazing. You know, it's such a, such a blessing. But this time, it wasn't like that. I get back, it's like 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, and I just check in on it, you know. And it's just, it's just a wreck. The whole place is covered in dishes. And I was like, what was this, like a spaghetti feed for a bunch of runners or something? It was just, everything was caked on. And I was like, forget it. I, you know, I've been working 24 out of the last 36 hours, and, you know, I can't do this. And uh, I don't know what it was. That's, that's got to be grace at that moment. But I had this, this one openness in my mind, this one tiny little yes in the midst of all these no's. And it said, well, maybe just do a couple. You know, you can do a couple tonight, and then in the morning you can finish it up. And so I thought, okay, all right, well, what's going to make me feel good, you know, if I'm doing that? Oh, maybe I'll put on Radio Ananda. And that's, Radio Ananda can really, can really help. So, um, <laughs> see, Laura's nodding there. Yeah, um, they always have it on at their house. Um, and so I put on Radio Ananda, and it's like 45 minutes later, the place is spotless. Couldn't believe it. And I wasn't crashing. I was like, okay, well, what do I do now? I could go meditate. You know, it's like 12 <laughs> o'clock at night. And just that one yes, that openness, um, led, to, led to a trajectory of activity that was so free. And, was, and it was just so powerful to see that, that we have no idea how powerful we are. And not us, but how powerful God is. When we can open ourselves up to prana, when we can open ourselves up to divine energy, it can flow through us. And we have this little world that we live in. We don't even question it. Question your personality, you know? Question what you think you are. And watch that expand from that question. Allow yourself to be open. Say yes to life. Uh, one of Master's most advanced disciples, Yogananda, uh, whose teachings we follow here, um, Sister Gyanamata, she would say, say yes and make it snappy. <laughs> don't give yourself an opportunity to say no. Uh, another example, um, Hriman and Padma asked me to do Raja with Bhakti, my wife, and you know I had just started managing the store, and I thought my life was busy, etc., just like before. And so I thought one more night of the week where, you know, where with that's unstructured. I love that. I, I still I still cling to that unstructured time. Um, and I said, no, nah, let me think about it. And I thought about it for like three months. I totally said no. Um, and it's not always easy to say yes and make it snappy. But eventually, you know, you can't, you can't avoid it long, uh, forever. And so it came up, okay, we really got to know because we're going to put it out in the newsletter, you know, who's doing it. We need a teacher. Um, and so then I said, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. You know? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even yes yet. It was, I'll try it out. Maybe a, a um, whatever they call that, a, a pro probation period or whatever it is. Um, I'll feel it out, you know, still not saying yes. And it's turned out to be an em enormous blessing. I've got a night every week, uh, Tuesday night every week at East West where we're doing Raja, and it's like a given um, satsang period. It's, uh, there's going to be meditation, there's going to be studying the teachings, there's going to be divine friendship, and it's built in. It's such a blessing, you know? I, wouldn't, I would not have chosen that without being in community. I would not have said yes to that without the support that we have, that we take for granted, we really do. Um, to be together and to meditate together and to be in tune together uh, into these teachings gives us the support that we need that we can actually grow. And without that, you know, we're just not as strong. We don't have as much opportunity. But saying yes can be hard. And, um, you know, there's a story right now that they're doing down in Lodi, the Episcopal Church there, my mom's uh, doing a sermon on, about the, Jesus talks to the Pharisees and they say, you know, who, who, is, who truly does the will of God? Who truly um, lives a life of freedom, etc.? And he said, well, there were these two sons. Like, oh no, here he goes, another parable. Well, there were these two sons that, uh, and their father who, who owned a vineyard. And there was the elder and the younger son. And the first son... The father says, go out to the vineyard and work. And he's like, no way. I'm not going out there. And uh, 
And then later he does. He goes out into the vineyard. He repents, it says. He repents. He changes his heart. And he goes out and he works in the field. Second son says, oh, yeah, Dad, I got your back. I'll be out there. No worries. Uh, and this sounds familiar because William and I were like this when I was, he was, he was the one who was like, no way. But he'd always follow through. And I was always the one who was like, yeah, you know, we can, you, we can make it work. We can make it happen. And I just never would. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and, and so Jesus asked the Pharisees, which of these sons did the will of the father? And they all, of course, clear as day. Oh, the first son. And he said, exactly. Um, and, you know, and he goes on to say that when John the Baptist came, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's something to meditate on because we don't have to always say yes and make it snappy. That's the first, you know, that's our first hope is that we are enough in tune and, and open enough and flexible enough that we can just jump into the flow. But sometimes we don't, you know, like with me and doing Raja, you know, I took like three or four months, you know, before I could, before I could be open to the possibility that this is actually what I wanted to do with my time. Um, but Yogananda said that God does not mind our mistakes. He only minds our indifference. And a saint is a sinner who never gave up. And these, we're not here to get an A plus right out the gate, you know? We're here, we're here because we have a lot of karma to work through. We have a lot of past actions um, that were born of ignorance, that we weren't aware of the higher truth. It's a lot to work through, but we can do it. We can do it together. We can retrace our steps. We need to support each other, and we need to be the light and be the change that we wish to see in the world. And remember that we have this great responsibility uh, to one another. And I have a friend who's in our Raja class who uh, offered a really interesting rephrasing of the word responsibility. He, he said, responsibility is really our ability to respond correctly, uh, not so much a weight or a burden, but having the awareness to respond correctly. So we have this opportunity to not jump into our reactive, ego, small world. We can live in freedom, and we can shine that to one another and be examples. Uh, and it's a wonderful blessing that we have. Until God is present in our awareness, in the mundane parts of life, how can we be present in cosmic consciousness? How, if you, Lahiri would say, if uh, you don't make God your summer guest, when is he, how is he going to visit you in the winter? We have to get used to keeping the company of God, practicing the presence of God throughout our day. And when we step stumble and when we fail to reach our goals, you know, for me it's get that morning meditation, get that evening meditation in. You know, when we stumble and we fall, we need to share that with God as well. Uh, Yogananda would say, share your victories in life, praise God, um, and thank God and have gratitude, share your gratitude with God, but also share all of your failures with God and blame God. And he would have these, these amazing uh, feuds with Divine Mother vocally. Divine Mother, why did you create us in this way? Why are we in delusion? You know, it would be beautiful. But he kept God in his awareness at all times. We, can, we have that choice to keep that awareness of the divine with us at all times. So I wanted to end with this quote from the Bhagavad Gita that we read. Um, and just take a moment now, get into your meditative posture, gaze uplifted, and to visualize yourself as the yogi. O oh, Arjuna, be thou a yogi. Be free from desires and aversions. And just now visualizing yourself as the yogi that Krishna talks about. An ever tranquil heart, heedless of good or adverse fortune, with the will upraised to worship me alone, unceasingly. Loving deep solitude and shunning noise of foolish crowds. Calm focus on the self, perceived within and in infinity. These qualities reveal true wisdom, Prince. All that is otherwise is ignorance. Om. Peace. Amen. Like to
to read Yogananda's words from Whispers from Eternity. Thank you, Bhima, by the way. I sought to catch thee in the deep waters of superconsciousness. Little fishes of inspiration nibbled at my bait of meditation. My concentration bobbed, but every time I pulled, I missed thee. I baited the hook of my meditation with the tasty spice of love. The little fishes tugged, and I watched them do so with attentive zeal. Lo, my mind's float vanished beneath thy waves of bliss. O colossal denizen of my consciousness, I pulled at thee, and with a bound thou didst leap to the shores of my heart. Teach me to fish for thee ever in the deepest waters of my soul. Oh, amen. I'd like to give you an opportunity now to make an offering. Please take what you'd like to give, hold it in your right hand, and pray with me. Divine Mother, we offer to thee the fruits of our labors. Bless this offering, that it serve as a channel of thy light to truth seekers everywhere. Om. Peace. Amen. This song by Swami Kriyananda is called Song of the Nightingale. <coughs> nightingale, nightingale, sing of joy through the night. Teach my heart to impart everywhere your delight. Sing of moon rays on the rain, sing that love's not in vain. Every grief, every wrong has its ending in song. Nightingale, nightingale, sing of joy through the night. Teach all men how to spin clouds of gloom into light. Without silence, what is song? Without night, where is dawn? Were it not for men's woes, who would smile at a rose? Nightingale, nightingale, sing of joy through the night. Let each tone silence groan, earth and heaven unite. Morning laughter, evening tears, snow and blossoms all fade. Joy must sing in the night to face change unafraid. Nightingale, nightingale, nightingale. Announcements this week. 
This Wednesday, October 4th, join us for a dramatization of the incidents in the lives of St. Francis and Gandhi, which demonstrate their commitment to God's will through narration, drama, song, chants, and poetry. Devaki and Jamana have put together this program to honor the birth date of Gandhi and the death date of St. Francis in October. They say, we end the evening with a silent meditation, directing your thoughts to the power of a single individual with God to influence the world for good. On Sunday, October 8th, Imam Jamal Rahman, who is the co-founder and Muslim Sufi minister at Interfaith Community Sanctuary in Seattle, and adjunct faculty at Seattle University, as well author of several books, will give the talk at service here that day. Imam Jamal, together with Rabbi Ted Falcon, were featured guests at the Be the Change event this past June with Naya Swami's Jyotishan Devi. Imam Jamal joined up with Rabbi Ted Falcon and Pastor Don McKenzie after 9-11 to spread the message of interfaith dialogue, especially between the Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Jamal is an inspired storyteller who delights audiences with his gentle humor and timeless wisdom. This will be a Sunday service you will not want to miss. You are invited to a free festive evening of dinner and entertainment in the Yoga Hall on Saturday, October 14th at 6.30 p.m. All are welcome and your RSVP will help Lisa and Buddy plan and prepare the delicious Indian meal for the occasion. And it will allow us to have a place setting reserved especially for you. There will be music and an enchanting story from Tales of India by Morley. You're welcome to attend in your Indian finery. The evening will be an opportunity for an update on the yoga hall progress and to learn about the new plan for the next three years to support the yoga hall. With your generosity, we will be better able to grow into the additional mortgage and facility costs that have come with the completion of the yoga hall. Michelle Bois will be in the foyer for you if you haven't already RSVP'd. You're welcome to speak to her then. And lastly, before our, our affirmation, Ananda Community has a two-bedroom apartment available in mid-October. So please see me if you're interested or have questions. Now for our affirmation. I stand calmly amidst life's storms. I stand calmly amidst life's storms. Strength and courage fill my body cells. I stand calmly amidst life's storms. Strength and courage fill my body cells. I stand calmly amidst life's storms. Strength and courage fill my body cells. And inwardly, silently, I stand calmly amidst life's storms. Strength and courage fill my body cells. Amen. I want to thank Bhima for saying yes to life. <laughs> that was lovely. It's great to be back. We'll now have the Festival of Light, written by Swami Kriyananda. Let us lift up our hearts in a festival of light. The essence of this ceremony has been passed down from ancient times. O oh, waves that we are on the bosom of the infinite sea, joyfully together let us celebrate our own greater reality. For now, by God's grace, our redemption is at hand. The promise has been given. The divine light returning anew to earth has given us power, as the Holy Bible proclaims, 
to become the sons of God. Into our hands have been delivered the sacred keys of awakening. Abundant now is our hope. The Lord through the Bhagavad Gita promised, even the worst of sinners, by steadfast meditation on me, speedily comes to me. Again in that holy scripture he declared, even a little practice of this inward religion will free one from dire fears and colossal suffering. And whereas suffering and sorrow in the past were the coin of man's redemption, for us now the payment has been exchanged for calm acceptance and joy. Thus may we understand that pain is the fruit of self-love, whereas joy is the fruit of love for God. From sun and moon and all the stars, from glistening seas, high mountains, desert solitudes, and vast fruitful plains, and from the hearts of mankind and of creatures everywhere, goes up in wordless yearning a prayer for redemption. Please stand and repeat after me. O mighty source of all that is, O mighty source of all that is, from sorrow lead us to everlasting joy, from sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From death lead us to immortality. From death lead us to immortality. Oh, oh peace. peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A fledgling bird once flew out into the world gain strength and wisdom its parents told it and what you acquire share with others even as we have shared with you for you are a part of all that is thus lord we left you countless eons ago ours was a holy mission you charged us to learn great lessons from life to be fruitful in the gifts you had given us to expand and multiply them alas we abandoned our mission instead we hoarded selfishly nor did wisdom come to us when repeatedly we lost everything we had. For the young bird in flight for the first time gloried in its newfound strength. It began to think, how foolish I would be to share my strength with anyone. What else is wisdom if not to keep what is mine for myself? And so we, like that bird, entered upon the second stage of the soul's long journey away from its home in God the stage which is called the revolt. That bird's brief day was like eons of our time. When afternoon came, it entered a storm cloud and soon found itself struggling for its life. Wind and rain lashed at its wings. The more it fought back, the weaker it became. Give yourself into my hands, cried the wind. To your strength, I can then add my own. At last, the little bird heeded this counsel. Then suddenly it found itself soaring joyously high above the clouds. Hours passed and night fell. The little bird grew afraid. How, it cried, can I fly in this darkness? And the night whispered, fear not, for lo, peace awaits you in the unknown. Surrender to me and your strength will be renewed. And after a time, the tiny rebel surrendered and found the night's counsel true. And rain and sky and grassy fields all saying, Behold, the very, your very strength to fly has never been your own. Look to the source of all power if you would conquer fear and weakness. And the bird asked, Where can I find that source? And they answered, Seek it in the farthest depths of being in your own self. Thus, gradually, the bird entered that third stage of the journey, which is called the, the quest. We now, like that little bird, have come to realize that buffeting winds are life's way of giving us strength and courage, that even fear, like shadows on a statue, gives us light and substance to hope. From the depths of unknowing, Lord, we cry out to thee, is there no lasting purpose to our lives? Behold, all that we thought was light was but darkness. 
Who are we in reality? For what end were we made? Ever and again, through your awakened sons, the answer comes. The forming of stars and moons and planets, of galaxies revolving on the tides of space, of drifting continents, upheaving mountains, snowy wastes, and dark, silent ocean deeps, had but this for its design, the birth of life, and with life's birth the dawn of self-awareness, passage through dim corridors of waking consciousness to emerge at last into infinite light, into perfect joy. O children of light, forsake the darkness. Please stand. Know that forever you and he are one. Raise your hands in chanting Om. Ask that the power of God replenish you in body, mind, and soul. Such, O Lord, was your promise. Gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. A prayer of love went up from earth, and you responded. A ray of your light flashed out from the heart of infinity, burst downward through night skies of consciousness and was born on earth for the redemption of mankind in human form. Many times has that light descended, drawn to earth by the call of aspiring love. Your chosen people have always been those of every race and nation who with deep love chose thee. Please pray with me, O Lord. With all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and with all my strength, I choose thy love. I choose only thee. The infinite Christ consciousness, the only begotten, has come down anew to earth for the salvation of mankind. When we need you, Lord, our beloved, you descend. Our human griefs, your love alone can mend. By proud indifference unaffected, though eternally rejected, you remain our friend. Long we fear to face 
filled with divine love, Jesus appeared to the great master Babaji. The lights in the high altar of my church, he said, have been growing dim, though still lit on lower altars of good works. The noble taper of inner communion with the Lord burns low and is ill-attended. Let us together, united in Christ's love, set lights ablaze on that high altar once again. Thus a new ray of light was sent to earth through the great masters of this path. Greater can no love be than this, from a life of infinite joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of mankind. Such ever has been the sacrifice of the great masters for the world. Here then is the fourth and last stage of the soul's long journey through time and space the redemption. Lord, we offer up the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity. Grant us the grace to know thee and make us ever increasingly pure channels of thy love to all. Please stand. Thy light within us shining as celebrate the grace of God that has come anew to earth through our line of gurus, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Sri Yukteswar, and Paramahansa Yogananda. This grace is eternally channeled to mankind by great masters in every religion. It has been given new clothing by our gurus to reflect man's dawning awareness that matter is only a manifestation of divine energy. In God all are equal, not only Jesus Christ, Lord Krishna, and great saints everywhere, but even in essence those on earth who have sinned most greatly. Joyfully lifting up our hearts in song, we pray that we who earnestly seek communion with your light receive it in our lives abundantly. It's your birthday. Father, Mother, Friend, our God, we thy wonders all acclaim. Father, Mother, Friend, our God, we thy wonders all acclaim. May our thoughts be only of thee, train our hearts to sing thy name. May Thy name, all is 
invite those of you inclined to come up to the altar and receive the touch of light from the masters. As you approach, offer a prayer of gratitude to the infinite Christ in whose love our line of masters have descended that we might all come to God. Pray, too, for the grace to share with all as you have received, for you are a part of all that is. May the light of Christ, the infinite consciousness, shine upon you. Om Christ, Amen. Om Christ, Om. 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 Amen, Om Christ, Om, Om Christ, 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 Amen. have a brief moment of silence. Now let us stand and send out to all the world the blessings we've received. Joy, God's life.
night has descended Sing out, sing out with joy All our nights have ended Sing out, sing out with joy God's light has descended Sing out, sing out with joy All our nights have ended Light in every mountain Light in every valley Light from all the masters We live in the Lord Light in every joy, God's light has descended. Sing out, sing out with joy, all our nights have ended. Sing out, sing out with joy, God's light has descended. Sing out, sing out with joy, all our nights have ended. Light in every mountain, light in every valley, light from all the masters we live. Divine Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswa, and Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions, humbly we bow at your feet. O Divine Mother, bless me with a calm heart and a calm mind so that I may perceive your will, your voice, your guidance. In all things. things. Oh, Shanti. Amen. Amen. Go out with joy and say yes to life. (laughs) Joy, 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 ever new joy, joy. Hi friends, really nice to be here with you guys today for Reverend Bima's first sermon. (laughs) Many more to come. Um, I I don't know about you guys, but I was really glad Rocky took that parachute. (laughs) Would like to invite everybody next door to the yoga hall. There's a special birthday celebration that's going to happen and lots of good stuff from the farm stand. Om Guru.